Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Classroom Matters podcast with me, your host, Christy Hull, where we dive into the hottest topics in education. Now, whether you are a public school teacher, a private school teacher, a homeschool parent, we get burned out, you know, homeschool parents get burned out and stressed out and unhappy sometimes too, or whether you just have children that go to school and you're a parent, I think this episode is going to be really intriguing and interesting to you, no matter where you are um, with your with your child or with folks in education. Our guest today is Grace Stevens, who is a former corporate girl, and I love that phrasing, a former corporate girl. Grace quit her VP life to pursue her dream job as a public school teacher. And after 20 years in the classroom, she now focuses full-time on helping educators have a more positive teaching experience. Her published book, Positive Mindset Habits for Teachers, is a bestseller, and it is really one of the, one of the greatest resources and guides for the core of what we're doing as educators, which is being happy, less burnout, less stress, and how do we achieve that? Grace, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to dive right in because Grace and I were talking a little bit before we hit the record button and um, tell us a little bit. It's intriguing to me how you went from, you, you've you've sort of been through a journey with careers. You uh-huh. started corporate, then you were in public education, and now you're doing all this work. So kind of take us back, Grace, to how that that journey has has brought you to this? Yeah, so I started off maybe like um, a lot of your listeners, like playing with my dolls when I was little and playing school and being the teacher and, and all those things. I always wanted to be a teacher. It was my dream. I loved school when I was young, going to school was my safe place. <laughs> like I knew the rules. I knew how it worked. I was a pretty good student. So I loved all that. And then when I ended up, um, lived in various places in Europe, ended up graduating and took a job because like most people, like that's what you were supposed to do. So I ended up in the corporate world and um, I really I did enjoy it for a very long time. Um, but I kind of met all of my goals. I know I don't want to sound arrogant. By the time I was 30, like I was making really good money, had the house, had all the stuff. But now I had young kids and I was just constantly stressed, overwhelmed, overworked, never felt like any area of my life got enough. Like work always needed more of me. My kids needed more of me. And I was really at a breaking point. And so I decided to make this big career change and follow my dream of being a public school teacher, which was not without um, quite a bit of drama to my family, I do have to say, right? Mm -hmm. Two young kids going back to school, giving up the career. But I started teaching. Magical. Loved it. Um, It hit so many things that I was looking for. Purpose, connection, like all the things. And then it wasn't perfect. And maybe when some of you are hearing me describe my corporate life, you're like, well, yeah, that's where I'm at right now in teaching. And it Mm -hmm. is overwhelmed, too stressed, nobody getting enough of me, Um, like feeling like I'm not successful anywhere because there's just too much stuff. And so I really was feeling all the same things, overwhelmed, burnt out, could not, could not change careers again. So decided to um, do the work to change myself. Like when you look at the science, like the things that I thought would make me happy, purpose, connection, having fun, education has the potential for all of that, right? And so I really did a deep dive into positive psychology, neuro-linguistic programming, bunch of nerdy stuff to kind of just find a way to make myself happier in teaching and um, and that's what happened. And it hasn't been a straight path. It's not like oh, the fairy tale ending. Like, you know, I was in education for 20 years and, you know, I figured it out and I was happy for a really long time. And then I changed schools and then uh, it was super stressful again. And I had to go back to, you know, the habits that I knew would work for me. So it kind of went up and down. But as a general rule, it was way more up than down. And it seemed to be very different than the um, experience other teachers were having. And so what happened then was I had committed. I told myself I wanted to be a public servant for 20 years, worked in Title I schools. Um, And then I I knew I had started teaching later in life. I knew I was never going to have enough uh, retirement. (laughs) 
mm-hmm. <laughs> money put aside, right? So I always knew I was going to need a third career. So um, I stepped out of the classroom last year. I wanted to stick through it through COVID, through getting the kids back in the room, through helping with that transition. And then I decided that I was going to spend, you know, the next 10 years, hopefully, um, helping teachers have a better experience, mm-hmm. because I really feel like um, that is something that there's not enough focus on. So I went from corporate girl to public servant now to like, what do we call ourselves? Solopreneurs. We'll see, mm-hmm. we'll see how far it goes with that. But um, I did write three books on teaching while I was still in the classroom. So that's how mm-hmm. I find myself here today. But my heart is still in the classroom. All my teachers, all my mm-hmm. friends are still teachers. So. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you say that when you say your heart is still in the classroom, because I was talking with someone yesterday who had been in the classroom for 20 plus years and then, you know, sort of moved up the ladder to administration. Yeah. And then now they're, they're out doing similar things to what you're doing. They're trying to help uh-huh. other teachers and educators. And, you know, I was a teacher for, you know, many, many years before I decided to move out of the classroom. And I think you're right. You know, I know, I know that folks that are listening that have are either in the classroom now or have moved out of the classroom really do feel like once yeah. you are a teacher in a classroom full of children, like you never leave that space really you know, you might be doing other things, but you always sort of your core goes back to wanting to help the students sitting in those chairs and the teachers, you know, in front of them. And, you know, you also said that you talked a little bit about what science says, you know, and uh-huh. the research. And I know that we've, we've all seen the, the statistics over the last couple of years about teacher burnout and teacher shortage. Yeah. You know, I think that the person that I was speaking to yesterday, we said, you know, it's like 50% of teachers are already trying to think of a way to get out of the classroom. And we're talking good teachers are wanting to leave. What are you finding oh, yeah. in yeah. your work that you're doing? Um, what are what are you finding? If you could list like the top three to five things that are causing teachers to be so unhappy, what are those things, you know, that you're seeing on average? One of them is occupational self-direction, right? And so one of the things for me was I loved having my little units and teaching the way I wanted to teach. You know, my job was to teach the standards, not the curriculum, not the book that came. That was a tool, like the curriculum was a tool, but it wasn't, you know, I, around the time that that shift started, I don't know if any of your listeners are have been teaching long enough to remember when the shift started, that literally I used to feel like the curriculum piece came around. Mm-hmm. Your objectives were on the board. You needed to be on the same page on mm-hmm. the same day as the other three teammates. Like anything that was joyful, creative, yeah. fun, got sucked out of the curriculum. Mm-hmm. And um, I went from, in my own experience, from a school that had very limited resources, um, where you had to come up with everything yourself, which for some people was very stressful, but for me was so fun, right? It was so fun to going to another district that was very regulated and very, you know, so that was like a huge um, point of stress, especially when you know kids aren't getting it. You know when kids are getting it or not. And then you feel like you can't kind of veer off the path. Mm -hmm. Um, I think another thing that teachers find very stressful, depending where there are, but like very mandated minutes on this and mandated Mm -hmm. minutes on that. And then, you know, when you lose control of a class, when you know they're not getting it, you need to be able to say, like anything, okay, let's take a pause. Let's Mm -hmm. go read our book like I love to read out loud to children you know pick up the book and they want to like sit in the reading chair or the kids like even up to fourth grade fifth grade they like to be read to right and so just change the energy in the room right that was always my thing your energy teaches more than your lesson plans right and so the fact that um, that piece for a lot of teachers has been taken away is really one of the fundamental things that Mm -hmm. brought joy into it and then the other thing is um the fact that as a whole um teachers get into this position this uh, educators get into this because we have a carer's heart we have a servant's heart we want to fix we want to help and 
all those things are beautiful, but kind of the murky side of that is a complete inability to set healthy boundaries. Yeah. Right. We don't set boundaries. We don't say no enough. Mm -hmm. We um, we're afraid of conflict. We don't want to be in that space. Like we'll Mm -hmm. just keep everybody happy. And it's literally impossible to keep everybody happy when you have the amount of students we have with the parents they have, with the problems they have, with the lack of support, like at any given point, somebody's not going to be thrilled with you. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's very stressful if you take those things very personally and you try and please everybody and you don't have a very fixed compass, which Mm -hmm. is I'm here for the students. I know what students need. And sometimes when I close my door, I need to be a revolutionary. Yeah. And that means like, uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You smile at everybody and say yes. And then you close your door and then you do what you need to do. And sometimes it is not that curriculum. So Mm -hmm. there's that. So the lack of of time, lack of resources, more being put on your plate. What I found, and I'm not just patting myself on the back, but for some reason I got into education later in life and I already had children and I had already had a big career where I had to negotiate and keep people um, happy and conflict Mm -hmm. resolution, all those things. And so given that, Like I always found classroom management really easy. Like I just had ninja skills. Kids minded me. I don't know. Maybe it's my Mm -hmm. accent. Maybe I had the teacher look down, but like I didn't have a lot of classroom management problems. And because of that, like sometimes you feel like you get penalized. You get every child that has a behavior issue in my class. Oh, because I can handle them. Every difficult parent in my class because, oh, like, you know, never sent a kid to the office, Mm -hmm. never had a parent complain. Does that mean I had all the perfect things? I just had kind of the skills and the experience to deal with that, that maybe some younger, newer teachers don't have. I Mm -hmm. mentored a new teacher my last year that I was there. Oh my gosh, that poor girl. Like, parents went for her just because she was young right like oh, what does she know like you know I never had to deal with that so um, I feel even some of the really great teachers are really getting burnt out on the yeah. fact that why is it always me why do I get every mm-hmm. room clear kid how is that fair to anybody certainly not the other kids in the class mm-hmm. right and yeah. so that's like the really good teachers are getting feel like dumped on mm-hmm. I, I don't feel anybody really says that enough like yeah. listen it's hard when you're struggling but it's also hard when you're a really good teacher or you're that teacher who suddenly after one year in your position is the lead teacher because of turnover and you spend half your year retraining somebody and retraining somebody and retraining somebody it's not really your job your mm-hmm. job is the kids yeah the fact the fact that we're hiring teachers who aren't qualified that's not their fault it's not my mm-hmm. fault either like I already got a job I shouldn't have to train them to right? I want to support them, but at the same time. So those are some of the things I think that are really burning people out. Mm -hmm. Aside from, yes, kids are dysregulated, you know, like all the things that came with, Mm -hmm. with, you know, after lockdown, like we're gonna, that's a big assumption already, teaching landscape has changed. But I think those are some of the more subtle things that people don't really realize are contributing to their stress Mm -hmm. and really why what I found for myself and for many others it's stress and it's a low-key resentment you know I know that that folks that are listening that are currently in a classroom setting are are just listening to you and they're saying yes 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 grace yep you got that right yep I'm upset about that and you know and I want to I want to circle back in a second to that phrase of low-key resentment because I want to touch on something with that that came into my brain but you know I feel like too I want to point out based on all the things that you just talked about that are causing this stress and burnout for teachers and really good teachers that people don't realize is in any other profession because you spoke about loading on more loading on more more responsibility more work more this more kids in your class without any giving the teachers anything in return. We're not getting promotions, you yeah. know, in another career or position. You know, <laughs> my husband, if they add a, you know, a whole extra project to his workload or to his position, he's probably going to get promoted and get a raise because now yeah. he's doing multiple jobs. But that doesn't happen in the world of education. Yeah, exactly. I think that, that people don't realize that, that we stay at the same salary, we stay at the same pay, we're still, but we're expected to do two, three, four times more every year because they just load it on. And I think, and I wrote this down, take advantage of yeah. teachers because like you said, teachers by nature are 
kind and nurturing and all they care about is their kids. And I'm probably not going to tell you, no, I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to spend my own money for my kids. I'm going to show up for my kids, whether you ask me to or not. And I think sometimes that gets taken advantage of because that's just who teachers are and they can't help themselves. Well, absolutely. Because we know that's the, here's the biggest phrase. It's for the kids. Yeah. Right. We get guilted into it. When you look at, you know, like I said, you know, in the early 2000s, you know, some people that's dinosaur years, right? But like we had arts and we had drama and we had other stuff. And when all those things got taken away and we were like, oh my God, but the kids need it. Like, and so we did it. I worked at a school where we didn't have a science teacher. And um, I'm like, oh my God, but these kids, like for me, um, astronomy, looking at the stars was magical. And so I took it on myself to put on a astrolo- astronomy night, um, get astronomers out. I, I would get this digital star lab that all the kids would climb in and watch projections of the night sky, like so much work, like mm-hmm. so much work. But I loved it because it lit me up right? Mm -hmm. It lit me up and I didn't mind that, you know, I had to get a sub for the week and write sub plans. And then I had to, um, you know, make the curriculum. I I had kids in that star lab from kindergarten who were afraid when you turned on the lights Mm -hmm. to eighth graders, right? So I had to write curriculum for eight grades, like so much work, but it lit me up. It was my favorite thing to do. And then you compare that to being asked to sit on a curriculum committee to unpack the standards. Like I call that an ice picker which is basically I would rather stick an ice pick Mm -hmm. in my eye than sit in that meeting, right? Like that's the stuff, like three hours of that and I'm feeling really put upon Mm -hmm. and you couldn't pay me enough. Um, Whereas the other stuff that lights me up, yeah, I want to give. There are teachers who love to coach and there are teachers who love to put on theatre. And, you know, so those are the things that light them up and we're happy to do that. It's the other stuff that we have to do that when you, yeah show up like it's back to school week here for me mm-hmm. in California the school that I taught in until last year is across the street seeing all the little kids first day of school today like oh my god with their new backpacks and all their stuff and I'm so excited but the other thing I know is it's the day where you have to sign up for your adjuncts right you have all like I don't know in every state but like in our state or at least in our district oh you have to sign up for 15 additional hours which is mm-hmm. a joke like some people are putting extra 15 a week, right. but these are the ones that they want school site council, curriculum mm-hmm. committee, leadership. Like, and so like I try and teach people be strategic, sign up for the things that, you know, at least you're going to be excited to do. For me, it was always something that involved kids sign up for something that has kids. Um, I had a teaching partner one time at the end of the day, could not bear to be with kids anymore. Sign him up for the curriculum committee. Because he, you know, fine, that's what he wants to do. So trying to be strategic, knowing that we do need to put in the extra hours. Like I would never sit in front of an educator Mm -hmm. and say, oh, yeah, just work your contract, quiet, quit. Right. There is no way. But the average teacher in the United States donates 15 hours for free to the school system. That's insane. Mm -hmm. Somewhere between contract hours and 15 extra hours a week there's a happy medium. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're going to put in an extra hour a day, five hours a week, be strategic, try and make sure it's stuff that fills you up. Yeah. Not that, you know, Mm -hmm. depletes Mm -hmm. you. Um, So there are things you can do, but it is pretty crazy. And it is, um, you know, like I said, I was in the corporate world. Every time I got a new customer, I got a bonus. Every time I dealt with somebody who was really difficult and turned that situation mm-hmm. around and got more business, I got a bonus, right? I got a promotion. Here, it's just more of the same. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where that low-key resentment that you talked about that's comes happy. in. And, and, and don't you feel like it's a little, and I don't know, maybe hypocritical is the word, but that as teachers, they are training teachers now for, you know, social emotional learning and the growth mindset and all things, you know, making kids feel good about themselves and be happy when they're, when they're in your classroom and, and building relationships with them so that they want to, you know, be their best selves and teaching to the whole child. But who's doing that for teachers, right? And so we're expected to do that for our children in our classrooms, but I don't really see any of, you know, there, there's not a lot of that going in to fill up teachers. And you sort of mentioned that like teachers filling up their buckets and doing things that make them happy and positive, which sort of brings me back now to your book, um, Positive Mindset Habits for Teachers. And so, 
you, you, you talked a little bit about why you wrote the book, but I want to talk about some of the things in the book now. And you said, you're not a negative person. You're not trying to be Debbie Downer, but I think all those things yeah. need to be said to get to yes. where we, you know, the teachers need to understand that you get it. You understand where they are, how they're feeling. <clears throat> um, you, you're, you're credible in that area. You've lived it. You're working with, you know, hundreds of teachers that are going through that. How can you help teachers to flip that mindset into a positive yeah. mindset? Okay, so let's talk about it. Um, I have a strong family history of very poor mental health. Like we say about kids sometimes in IPs, I'm going to say a constellation of issues, and let's just leave it at you. Mm -hmm. So one of the areas that really stressed me um, when I was so unhappy, having just had children in my corporate life, was I have had anxiety and depression my whole life and always felt that I was being very stalked by like I'm one bad thing happening away from like having a complete mental breakdown um and so it was really important for me to learn to hack my own happiness and so um it was important for me to understand that um really the science behind it. When you look at the science, like only 50% of your happiness quotient really comes down to your natural set point. You know, like some people are naturally optimistic. We call it their happiness quotient, right? That's only 50%. The other 10% is your circumstances, right? You think it would be way more than that, but it is actually only 10% for a lot of different reasons that we get used to our circumstances. We overestimate how much we think, um, good things will make us feel or how bad circumstances will make us feel, right? So that counts for 60%. The other 40% is um, your daily kind of habits, intentional things yeah. that you can do to boost your mindset. And I think when I first wrote, I wrote a book called The Happy Habit about 12 years ago. It wasn't about teaching. It was just about that. And um it wasn't, um, I think the idea with educators wasn't there so much, but thanks to, you know, all the work that we do with growth mindset now, yay, Carol Dweck, thank you. Yeah. We know that your intelligence isn't fixed, right? So just like intelligence isn't fixed, neither is your happiness fixed. You can make new neuro pathways, right? Mm -hmm. And you can kind of hack your own happiness. And that is what that book was about. What are the habits inside every day in your classroom with your kids, relating with others that you could adopt with intentionality mm -hmm. yeah. um, to make yourself be happier and have control? Because, you know, we know this, our brain was designed to keep us safe, right? It mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily designed to make us happy. <laughs> it hasn't evolved to that yet, right? And so it's that book was based on those intentional mindsets. So it's not that I'm a naturally, you know, optimistic, you know, person, but I figured out the things that when I do them, life seems manageable and easier and um, more um, friendly towards me, let's say. And when I, and I even looking at my own path in teaching, mm -hmm. um, when I have given up those habits, which take intention because I'm so busy and everything else is going on. Who the heck has time mm -hmm. for a, take a breath or a mindful moment, right? That's when the resentment comes back, the crabbiness comes back, and, mm -hmm. and then the kids feed off your energy and then they play up and then it just gets worse and worse and worse, mm -hmm. right? And so that's what that book was about, those intentional habits. And uh, there is no magic recipe. There's no magic planner. Mm -hmm. I would have found it if there was the perfect teacher planner, have a low-key addiction to those, always looking for the perfect yes. one. <laughs> like, like, like there's no um, magic thing. It's just things done intentionally every day and mindsets. And so that book was about bringing those mindsets, excuse me, into the classroom. What can you do with your kids? What can you do for yourself every day to kind of boost that? And so um, it is not, you know, toxic positivity. Like I say, a lot of that word has become like, you know, rampant in education now where administrators, when you go to them with real legitimate yeah. concerns, would just say to you, um, oh, just do your best. Well, that's not a stinking strategy. Like, just yeah. do your best right? Um, or like, you know, good vibes only, you know, that's like saying, <laughs> look, my gas tank, in, tank is on empty. I'm driving. Yeah. The needle is on empty. Um, let me put that little smiley face mm -hmm. sticker on it. That'll fix it. 
come on, right? So it's not about that. Um, and I don't feel that um, when people say, oh, you know, my campus is toxically, you know, positive or negative the other way. We all know the negative mm-hmm. Nellies that you try and avoid. Um, I feel like administrators are overwhelmed. They don't know what to do either, right? Yeah. So we can't just point the fingers at them. They're well-intentioned people. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they got people to please too. They also lean to learn to say no. If you're an administrator listening in, your job, Mm -hmm. when the craziness comes down from above, instead of passing it down to your staff, like your job is to say, Mm -hmm. no, my staff is doing enough and has enough to do. we got to find somebody else to do this. That isn't a teacher. It always trickles down to us. Every time a program is taken away, every time, oh, now there was a time I remember, remember, I've got to stay late on on Wednesdays and vacuum my room because we don't. Like, come on, when are, I'm a janitor now because, mm-hmm. like, the school doesn't have funds to hire a cleaning staff. Like, when did that become my problem? Yeah. But, yeah, I'm going to stay in Clorox the desks because this was even, you know, years before COVID. I don't want kids coming down sick, touching mm-hmm. everything. And, you know, like, every time something is taken away, it seems like it falls onto the teachers. Yes. So as we sort of roll back into the school year and and teachers are going back into their classroom and new teachers are starting maybe for the first year and everybody's gearing up at this point. What are some things that that folks can start doing with intentionality um, to give them, you know, a, a less stressed, happier start to the school year? Okay, so a couple of quick things is one is recognize that not everything is going to get done. Right. And so have some kind of, like I said, for yourself, like a very clear compass. And I always coach people on how to have a not to do list. Right. If you literally go down your list, like I'm going to do all the things, how much time is it going to take? I'm going to stay at my desk until the list is done. It will never get done. Right. So intentionally, what am I not going to do that's on this list this week? Um, so you're only going to drive yourself crazy trying to do it all get comfortable with setting boundaries learning a script that is student focused get comfortable with not apologizing you don't need to say oh unfortunately just say as it turns out as it turns out blah 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 blah. Um, another thing is try and bring the building blocks for happiness into your classroom any way you can so some of the building blocks are you know engagement connection so we know all those things connect with students engage with students, try and have some fun, some joy, take some brain breaks, take brain, even as simple as, you know, I taught littles for years, the little starfish breathing. Uh, the first time I saw a kid put up their hand and say, Miss S, should we starfish breathe? I knew, like I said, I always say my energy teaches more than my lesson plans. They knew I was getting stressed. Like, it's not going to go well for me. Like, and the kid's like, let's take a break. Have a culture where it's okay for the kids to say, can we take a break? Not like so 20 of them go to the restroom, whatever. You know, just reasonably be confident about yourself knowing when things aren't going well, take a break, take a breath. Maybe sometimes you need more energy in the room, then you're going to take like a brain boost, right? You're going to run to the fence and back or you're going to, you know, do something to get everybody's energy up and then change. So feel like you have some kind of um, autonomy. Take back, right, your agency in your classroom right? It is your classroom. Those are your kids at that moment. So just like some of those things and like even simple things with the kids. One of the things I loved, all grades, a joy jar. How easy is that? Anything when just get kids into the habit and yourself into the habit for looking for stuff in the day that went right. A kid is helping somebody else or something funny happened to you all after the teacher. Put it in the joy jar, put it in the joy jar, write the little note, put it in there. And then when you do need a change of energy. Sometimes a kid will say to me, can we look at something from the joy jar? Sure. We got two minutes. Let's look, right? Get, you know, left to its own devices. The brain has a negativity bias. We know that. Like train it to look for good stuff. Um, Instead of just focusing on the two kids who drove you crazy all day, what about the other 25 who are actually doing what they're supposed to do? Like think about the stories that you carry around with you. You carrying around the good stuff or the bad stuff? I mean, those are just little habits. They sound so simple, right? Yeah. S- simple, not easy. Mm-hmm. Right. And have some kind of um, way of systematizing them. So one really simple thing, 
actually the first book I published on teaching was a journal, a positive mindset habit journal. And it had a whole week. You wrote down the three best things that happened that day before you go home, kind of like a closing ritual Mm -hmm. of the good stuff in your mind before you leave. Um, What kid am I going to champion this week? So have some intentionality about that. Mm -hmm. Write down the funniest part of the week just to get your brain to look for the Mm -hmm. good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Grace, thank you so much. These are all such great, you know, and like I said, I'm really hoping that our listeners are going to jump back into the school year doing some of these intentional things. You know, I'm excited for the school year to to blast off and for all the great things. Um, I know you are too. And so tell all of our listeners where they can find you, where they can find resources and get in touch with you if they really need your assistance. Okay, so easy peasy. Just my name, Grace Stevens, Stevens with a V. Um, and um, gracestevens.com. And if you go to gracestevens.com forward slash happy, um, there's a recorded masterclass there about the five things that the happiest, um, most effectively stressed teachers do. And so that's a good place for people to start. And then that will um, subscribe you to like bring you into my world and then like after that I send you like a copy the the journal that I just talked about there's a six-week digital version that I'll send you a pdf all the good stuff um so um I'm not terribly social long story for that but I am at um at Grace Stevens teacher on tiktok um, and Instagram, um, but gracestevens.com, good place to start. And new podcast, hopefully will be up by the time this airs, Empower Ed, All Things Teacher, Balance Burnout. Um, so Empower Ed, Empower Ed. So, okay. Well, thank you, Grace. This is, I mean, what a great conversation. Um, great information for teachers. You know, we really, really need all of this right now. And so, you know, I know you love teachers. I love teachers. You know, yeah. it's, we have to keep them um, happy and less stressed. Um, and and I know that that's difficult to do now, but thank you so much for being on the All show. Right. Um, and we'll have to check back in as the school year gets underway and, you know, mid-semester and see how your work's going and maybe touch yeah. base and, and see how Absolutely. the happiness level is going yeah. <laughs> of our and, listeners. Yeah, um, and, and see and, how they're doing. And, yeah, so thank you so much again for being All on right. the show. All right, appreciate it. Bye-bye. And this is Christy Hull signing off for this episode of the Classroom Matters Podcast.